Welcome back to Challenges of Faith Radio with the founder and host, Gary McCants, and co-host, Deborah Landrum. I'm Deborah, and it is a genuine pleasure to meet you. Thank you for tuning in. I was able to get the analytics for this program, and you've listened from across 134 cities and 25 states with 100% of the listeners being women. 50% of you age 35 to 44, and the other 50% age 45 to 59, women. We seem to get it done, don't we? Come on, men, keep up. Ladies, God gave us his emotions to teach it to man. Encourage the men in your life to tune in. Just a little side joke, I was reminded of a short poem I once heard by an unknown author, but told to you for purposes of education. Three wise women would have asked for directions, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, clean the stable, make a casserole, brought practical gifts, and there will be peace on earth. Ladies, we know how to get it done. Come on, men, keep up, because we know you can. So, We're on part two of this journey of hope, and the topic is genuine. If you haven't heard part one, please feel free to go back and listen to it where the topic is trust. The reason I say go back and listen is because trust is synonymous with genuine. You can't have one without the other. Today we're talking about different characters we are, have been, or know someone who he is. The first character is Mr. and Miss Sincere, a.k.a. Genuine. This individual is one who is interested in meeting, communicating, and being trustworthy, intimate, honest, committed, transparent, listener, forgiver while being forgiven, sensitive, and showing genuine, valid, love, or care. Unfortunately, oftentimes, unfortunately, oftentimes, they do not heed their own warning signs. That is to ensure prior to releasing their vulnerable emotional guards, the individual of interest is or will be reciprocating the same characteristics. Ooh, we... Now, I know for sure this one is me. Is it you too? In part one, I shared a brief glimpse into my personal journey about how there was a secret in my family, which was me, you know, the one giving up at birth, the so-called unwanted one. I asked the question then, is that you also? Or maybe you find yourself in a homeless shelter or maybe sitting in a jail cell, or maybe find yourself in an abusive relationship, or someone who just feels their parents just don't care about them. And you're wondering, how did I get myself in this pickle? More importantly, how am I going to get out of it? Oh, so you thought I was going to leave this topic alone. No, sir. No, ma'am. We're on this journey of hope. And I know it can be painful at times, but this conversation is necessary. You see, it is the goal of Challenges of Faith to shed a little light on your journey in order to make the road you're traveling a little lighter. And you know, to help you avoid some of those landmines along the way. So you're wondering, how did I get myself into this? Well, let's see. Could it be? You trusted that so-called genuine partner to pay the rent. Or maybe you trusted that so-called friend, you know, your ride-or-die partner, you know, the one who turned on you. So I ask the question again, who are you trusting and calling genuine? Let me tell you a story from my own journey. When you're giving up and tagged unwanted, there is a burning sizzling desire to make that right. As humans, we internalize trauma and blame ourselves. So I spent the majority of my adult life, the majority of my adult life, 
trying to be Miss Sincere, a.k.a. genuine, and trying to prove to people that I'm worthy of love and that I really am a nice, genuine person and not tag the unwanted child. As a result, people stepped on me, took advantage of me, especially men. So eventually, I became this indifferent. Let's see what the author has to say about Miss Indifferent, Mr. or Mrs. Indifferent, a.k.a. Unconcerned. And it reads, for some unknown reason, individual has elected to be at a distance from others. Forget about receiving any form of affection, being given or receiving gifts, Something or someone has possibly harmed them and hurt has entered their picture too many times and is simply to be for self and only self. And I ask, is that you today? I know it's me. Um, so, you know, um, oh, we girl, this is getting ready to get good. Don't go nowhere. Hang in there. Do you see how Mr. and Miss Genuine are synonymous with Miss? Do you see how Mr. and Miss Genuine is synonymous with Mr. and Miss Indifferent? Sort of like trust is intertwined with genuine. So back to the subject that you thought I was going to leave alone because of painful memories. So I spent almost my entire life looking for, especially my mother, to say two words, and that is, I'm sorry. Needless to say, I never heard that from her, not even on her deathbed. In fact, what I heard from her was almost the complete opposite. Needless to say, I felt so distraught And as I was leaving that facility and passing through the halls, trying to hold back the tears, but couldn't, I was absolutely devastated. When I got home, I asked God how could he allow this. I told him how devastated I was. Of course, he already knew. Let me tell you how spectacular Jesus is. He hid me beneath his wings and nourished me back to health. This didn't happen overnight. It was a journey for a few years. Today, call my mother blessed. Because you see, at the end of the day, God revealed all to me. First, she was the tool that God used to birth me into this world. We were never meant to bond because God had a plan for my life, and I couldn't be attached to the bonding that goes with the mother and daughter. Secondly, she was only human, like me, like you, therefore subject to air. Young women do a lot of things they wouldn't do. Third, the one thing she did do is consistently take me to church, beginning at a young age. It is there Jesus introduced himself to me. So she gave me the one thing, the greatest thing, the only 100% genuine love she could find, which is Jesus. And today I call her blessed. This is why I tell you don't give up. Things may look bleak right now, but our Lord and Savior has a way of working it all out for the betterment of those who love the Lord. Do you love Jesus? Do you trust him? He is 100% genuine. I remember when I was in the homeless shelter, some people would God help those who help themselves. I say God helped me when I couldn't help myself, and he'll do it for you. Trust the process, and the process is a journey. If you haven't accepted Christ, accept him today. The Bible says believe in your heart. Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. God says 
the only way to him is through his son, Jesus Christ. Listen, Gary is here, and I'm going to turn this mic over to my dear brother in Christ, the founder and host of Challenges of Faith. Thank you. Welcome back to Challenges of Faith radio program. I'm Gary McCann. Thank you for joining. Okay, so we're talking about a person in a relationship, any person, any form of relationship. And we established that the last time. You remember? It could be between you and your landlord, your bank, your car dealer, your doctor, the system, whatever the system happened to be, your neighbor, politician. Remember, we're talking about the person who's supposed to be genuine. You know, the dictionary truly points it out. It says something to be authentic. From a secular standpoint, genuine things are true or authentic. And when you're talking about people, being genuine has to do with being sincere. This word has to do with things and people that are true. A genuine friend is a real friend that you can trust when the chips are down. So let's continue looking at the genuine person from a secular standpoint. You don't mind, do you? Genuine people who are supposed to be just that, who they are. They know that some people going to like them and some are not. And you notice, <clears throat> and maybe that's you, they're okay with that. And it's not that they don't care whether or not other people are like them, but simply that they're not going to let that get in the way of doing the right thing. That individual is willing to make unpopular decisions and to take unpopular positions if that's what needs to be done. Genuine people are open-minded, supposed to be approachable and interesting to others. Maybe there's somebody that comes to your heart and mind. You know that nobody wants to have a conversation with somebody who's already formed an opinion and is not willing to listen. That person who's supposed to be genuine, they don't derive their sense of pleasure and satisfaction from the opinion of others, remember? Because that allows them to have their own internal compasses because they know who they are and they don't pretend to be anything else. That person who's genuine is generous with whom they know, what they know, and the resources they have access to. And you notice how they treat everyone with respect because they believe they're no better than anyone else. You notice that <clears throat> they don't need any fancy stuff in order to feel good. It's not that they think it's wrong to go out and buy the latest and greatest items to show off, you know, in terms of their status with pride. They just don't need it to be happy. Maybe that's you. Do you notice that with that genuine person as I grab my tea this morning? Oh, it's nighttime. <clears throat> Do you notice that that person <clears throat> find people gravitating toward them because they're genuine? Because they know they can trust that person. And individuals who are genuine have a strong sense of self. They don't need to go around seen offense that really isn't there. And do you notice how they create connections and find depth even in short everyday conversations and that their genuine interest in other people make it easy for them to ask good questions and relate to what they're told to other important facets of the other person's life? Do you notice that they don't make decisions based on their egos, you know, E-G-O-S? Because they don't need the admiration of others in order to feel good about themselves. And do you notice that they practice what they preach? Remember now, you've always heard me talking about the lips got to match the shoes. But they don't need to brag because they're confident in their accomplishments. But they also realize that 
When you truly do something that matters, it stands on its own merits, irrespective of how many people notice or appreciate it. And before I go on, does any of those attributes fit you? You. You say you're a genuine person. Well, do they fit you? How about a good Samaritan? You know, a good and genuine person. How about in your relationship? Whatever it is. What does the Word of God have to say about the genuine, good Samaritan? You know, over in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, because I know you wrote it down. We call this the parable of the good Samaritan. But it's more than just a story. I know you beat me there. You know, when our Savior spoke these words, you notice he was focusing the white light of his judgment on the human heart. Because each of us, if we're going to be genuine, real, we're in the story, especially in one way or another. And don't try to escape. I know you're trying. But it's talking about a man walking down the road alone. And when you look at this man, what do you see? Tell me what you see. And I'll tell you what's in your heart. Because in this story, you're going to see five different attitudes towards this man. Five attitudes that you find today. Look around wherever you happen to be globally. Doesn't make the difference where your zip code is, your economics, your skin tone. But to the thieves, you know, T-H-I-E-V-E-S, this man was a victim to exploit. Maybe that's what you're doing out there. I don't know. You know. But our society is filled with things and people, and God made them both. And do you notice how God wants you and I to use things and love people? But do you notice how it's been reversed? We love things and we use people. Maybe they're shooting. And if we are even willing to hurt people in order to get the things we love, Whatever, any time you hurt a person in order to secure something that you selfishly want, you're guilty of exploiting. And later on, when we really get into these relational discussions, you're going to see the, the end result of what's going on with hurting people, especially when one has to go to the hospital or lose their livelihood or their life or their life. But you can always tell the exploiter, especially when you meet them, you can tell they always take. They never give. They hurt. Don't heal. They talk. They don't listen. Do you notice their only interest is to use you for their own purposes? And whether or not you're hurt or robbed, it doesn't bother them, just as long as they get what they want from you. Do you notice how society is is filled with exploiters? Look around. And unfortunately, there are parents who use their children and then wonder why the children leave home. And there are husbands, you know, and wives who, who use each other. Exploit each other. And before you turn around and look, both of them are in divorce court. Petitions or their aides use their associates as stepping stones for their own career. And it never bothers them that they have to step on somebody else to get to the top. You heard me allude to that in our first topic involving trust. But also remind me, I gave a politician a book one time. And the chapter was called The Lonely Wine of the Top Dog. That's where an individual, irrespective of skin tone, irrespective of economics, irrespective of titles, irrespective of your zip code, that person just wanted to get to the top, whatever the top happened to be for them. And they walked on people. They dogged people. They used, misused, and abused people. And once they got to the top, 
there was no one else. They can climb over, walk over. What happened as they were headed back to the bottom? There's some places of worship and pastors that exploit people. A pastor can use their people in order to make them look successful. Do you notice that our Savior never exploited a person? Do you notice that? Do you notice how he never takes from us without giving more to us and anything he takes away is not good for us anyway? Do you notice how there are times when he seems to hurt us, but he never harms us and he always heals those wounds? Do you notice how our Savior never leaves that man, that woman, that woman, that man worse than he finds them? He always leaves them a better person. And as believers of the household of faith, You and I should not be using people. We shouldn't become exploiters. When we see another person, our question should not be, what can I get out of them? But what can I give to make their life richer, upbuilding? Do you notice the second attitude in this parable to the priests and Levites? Do you notice this man was a nuisance to avoid? Did they pass by on the other side? Maybe they should Think about it. Ponder it if you want to. You would have expected these two men to get together and help the victim. They were religious men, servants of God in the temple. Now, you knew they knew the law of God about loving one's neighbor. And here's an opportunity to minister to a human being in need. But guess what? They passed him by. But wait a minute before you start throwing your darts at them, before we criticize them too severely, We better count up the number of times you and I have passed by people and looked upon them as nuisances, you know, just like the priest and the Levite. We have our excuses. What's yours? Now, they could have said we've already served at the temple. It's been a busy week for us. But God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And remember now, Paul reminds us that love is the fulfillment of the law. Think about how easy it is for you and I to go to a place of worship, work at the place of worship, and even sacrifice for the place of worship, and yet pass by the very people who need our ministry the most. Do you notice that? Is that happening with you? And, of course, that priest and Levi may have said, well, (laughs) it isn't our fault that this person is in the mess they are in. Cain said Am I my brother's keeper? You know, when you really think about it, when you're looking at it from a secular standpoint, when you're looking at it from the spiritual, biblical standpoint, do you notice how historians tell us that hundreds of priests and Levites use that road from Jerusalem to Jericho? Have you ever thought about why it was so dangerous? Think about it. You think that a large number of these influential religious leaders could have done something about that road, that highway. They may not have been beaten, and they may not have beaten that guy, but their neglect made it possible for others to beat him. Can you imagine hearing that priest say, I won't stop, there's a Levite behind me, and he'll take care of that person. And then all of a sudden that Levite came along and said, there's a priest. (laughs) He didn't do anything, so why should I? You see how easy it is for you and I to pass the buck or use the other person as an excuse for doing nothing? You remember what our Savior said, inasmuch as you did it not to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it not unto me. You see, you don't have to hit the person and rob them. All you have to do is pass by on the other side. And you got to ponder, look around. Which people do you and I turn away from today that we see in need of help? Which people do we don't want to see? Because one day we're going to see them, and we'll see what negative end result happened to them because we passed them by. But what did the lawyers see in this man? In this story, you know, to the lawyer, this man was a problem to discuss. (laughs) Who is my neighbor, he asked our Savior, you know, trying to get out of a 
tight situation. Do you notice one of the best ways to do nothing at all is to call a meeting and talk about it? And maybe that's all you do is call a meeting and talk about it. You notice how easy it is to talk about problems and ignore people? Do you notice how easy it is? I remember... <laughs> I remember this politician says he was going to, a, every time he went to a meeting, a fighting broke out. Somebody defined a committee as a group of people who individuals can do nothing and collectively decide that nothing can be done. Enough of that red tape. Do something. Enough of that lip service. Do something. But you notice this lawyer in this story, in this parable, wanted to discuss a theoretical problem. But our Savior talked about one man who needed help. You see, the lawyer was interested in theory. Our Savior was interested in practice. Think about it. What are you interested in? Because that lawyer would have been happy to discuss theology all day, and maybe that's you, just as long as he didn't have to be involved. But you notice how our Savior turned the tables on him and said, the question is not who is my neighbor, but to whom can I be a neighbor? You notice our Savior went from the general to the specific, from the ivory tower to that dangerous road, that highway. You notice even in our own life, our Savior does not want us to be spectators on the road of life, or is that you? Do you notice he wants us to be involved? We run around, we pride ourselves with our chest all sticking out or head all up in the cloud and our understanding of the Bible and our ability to discern the times of the, you know, the signs and everything. And there's a lot of times we fail to test the lives of those who need the message of Christ, you know, helping them where they're hurting, meeting them where they are. And our lip service is a substitute for our walking. But let me ask you a question. You don't mind, do you? At your place of worship, is there a soul winner in your church? And I'm not talking about the individuals who have earned certificates or degrees. You know, those degrees in the study courses on witnessing. And even though who have, do you notice not one of them has ever won a soul to Christ as far as you know? But didn't James say something about being doers of the word and not hearers only? My brethren of a household of faith, may our Lord deliver you and I from looking at people as problems to discuss. May we see them through the eyes of our Savior as souls for whom he died. Now let's look at the innkeeper in the parable. What did he see in the man who was carried in from the highway? He saw a customer to serve. He was paid to take care of that man, so he took care of him. But you know, since we're pondering, since we're thinking, I know you are, I wonder how many brethren would be given that type of Christian service. And they don't have to be brethren. That's the point. That's the point. But since we're talking about believers of the house of the faith, looking for some type of reward because you are being Christ-like to somebody, are you walking around wondering what you're going to get out of it? Where are you? Okay, I'm going to let you take a moment to think about it. So you've answered your own question. Some of you are walking around talking about nothing now, but God's going to reward you one day. And then you pass by the other side. Unless there's some public recognition, you're not interested in the job. Remember, like Peter, he said, Lord, we have forsaken all to follow thee. What shall we get? You notice it was a powerful day in Peter's life when that what shall I get was changed into such as I have, give I thee. You notice how our Savior came as a servant. I am among you as one who serves. You notice how he reminded his disciples while they were arguing over who was the greatest, that our Savior was on his knees washing their feet. You notice how 
a living a life of Christ and for realness and in truth always demands sacrifice. You remember when Paul wrote to the Philippians? He said, in offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And you can see that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 17. Do you notice sacrifice and service? That those are the two marks of a ministry for our Savior's sake. And the question you got to ask and answer in your life, do you serve Christ for love or for some type of gain? Do your feelings get hurt if what you have done goes unnoticed by men and women, women and men? Are you content to let God keep the books and give the rewards? Are you walking around preaching and teaching and singing and visiting people and working at your place of worship because you have to or because you want to? Are you doing it all for the glory of God? Because you've got to go back to the story, to the parable. You see, to the innkeeper, this man was a customer of the serve, and the only link between him and the victim was a couple pieces of money. Do you notice that? And now when you get to the most important person in the story, the man we call the Good Samaritan, maybe that's you, what did he see when he saw that victim lying on the road? What do you see? Well, he saw a neighbor to love and to serve. Now, ponder all of that. And while pondering that, just remember who you see when you're passing by. But this Samaritan was the last person you would have expected to help because the Jews and Samaritans, they didn't have any dealings whatsoever with each other. And when you know the story, because I know you're going to read it, the Jews cursed the Samaritans in their synagogue services. The Jews regularly prayed that no Samaritan was sharing the resurrection. The Jews would welcome Gentiles who wanted to become Jewish proselytes, but they would never welcome a Samaritan. It was a part of the Jewish religion in that day to despise the Samaritan. And, of course, the Samaritan is a picture of what you and I must be along the road of life. Because every day we're going to meet individuals who are victims, you know, individuals who have been exploited, individuals who have been emotionally beaten and robbed and left for dead in many ways. And you already knew that, didn't you? But do you notice what the Samaritan did to help this man? He came where he was. Do you notice the priest, excuse me, and the Levite had walked by on the other side? But the Samaritan came where he was. When God wanted to make Ezekiel into a great prophet of hope in his captive people, you notice how he put Ezekiel right in the middle of that captivity? Do you notice how the prophet could say, I sat where they sat? You notice how the Samaritan came where he was? And the question you got to ask and answer, you see how easy it is for you and I to read about these problems or hear them talked about at a distance. Our Savior wants us to go where they are, to sit where they sit. In essence, there was human contact. You notice when the Samaritan saw him, he had compassion on him. And when you get into the, you notice how we start off with the secular definition. But when you get into this compassion You notice how powerful it is in the Christian vocabulary? And when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. When our Savior saw the widow in the funeral procession, you notice how he was moved with compassion on her and said, you notice how compassion speaks of the entire inner person yearning over the needs of another? My brother in the household, it's more than just pity. It's more than sympathy. It's Calvary's love. Think about it. That innkeeper, (laughs) he didn't have no compassion for that man. Remember, it was about the moolah. But the Samaritan did. Notice the risk he took to stop and help the man. And maybe the robbers were still in the area. But the love of Christ 
It doesn't think in terms of risk. It thinks only of sharing with those in need. And you notice what else that Samaritan did? Care of him. Do you notice how compassion never stands still? It always does something. And unlike that lawyer in the parable story, the Samaritan did not just talk about the situation. He did something. He poured in wine to cleanse the wounds, and he poured in oil to heal and soothe. He put the man on his own animal and took him to the inn. Can you imagine how dangerous it was to do that? But when we care, we think of the other person, not of ourselves. And do you notice what else that Samaritan did? He paid the bill in advance. The Samaritan knew he would never be repaid financially for what he had done, but he was repaid spiritually. Unlike the thieves, his philosophy of life was, what is mine is yours and I'll share it. The thieves said, what is yours is mine, we'll take it. Remember, my brothers of the household of faith, there's always a price to pay when you start to govern your life according to the life in Christ, the love of Christ. Our Savior revealed God's love. And think of the price he paid. I know you're pondering the price he paid. So when you look at the Good Samaritan, notice it's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ because you and I are the victims. Sin, Satan, and the world have robbed us, beaten us, and left us half dead. Remember, we were dead spiritually but alive physically. Our Savior came where you and I were. He was born in human flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And remember, he had compassion on us and cared for us. He shed his blood to heal sin's wounds. He paid the price. And now because of his grace, his mercy, his love, you and I are God's children now. Now having heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now understand your own sojourn. It's time we left that in caring for us. It's time for us to get on that highway of life, that road of life, where you and I can do for others something of what Christ has done for us. And I'm sure that our Savior wants you and I to escape from our little hideaway, you know, shelters that we're 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 running hiding to been at. It's time to get out where we can serve others. And the question you gotta ask and answer is what do you see when you look at people? How about the people on the streets? How about the people we work with and live with? How about the people we attend our place of worship with? Do you see people as victims to exploit or nuisances to avoid? Are they problems to discuss or customers to serve? Well, are they? Because you've got to remember our Savior wants you and I to see them as neighbors to love and help, as people with feelings and fears and frustrations that we can help remedy. Again, look around our globe today. It's dangerous. It's just as dangerous as that road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Think about it. A lot of people have fallen to the challenges of life. But may the love of Christ constrain you and I to to go where we're led, show compassion, give care, and love the way our Savior has loved us. Of course now, only under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit of God can we do it, especially as that genuine man and woman of God. For kingdom purposes, you know it as, the Great Commission. I know you do. I know you do. All right. So we've been talking about that genuine person today. You know, the one that you hopefully surround yourself with. You know, the one that hopefully you are with others in any type of relationship. But as you continue on today, your day have some food for you to ponder. You don't mind, do you? 
when you're meeting that person, irrespective of who they are, that we've already laid the foundation of in the first topic of trust, should you ignore your warning signs? Or should you? Do you just want to have a relationship with that person? It doesn't make different what type of relationship it happens to be. Remember now, it could be with your banker. 